I just don't understand how this carbon dioxide transport thing works. I got no idea how we're going to study this problem. Yeah, you know how she always picks out the little details. Just can't figure this out. Look guys, it's really easy. You just got to think about it that in a way that can make you understand it good. Well, then how do you think about it? Well, imagine this. Carbon dioxide transport is actually pretty easy to understand when you think about it in terms of metaphors. One way that carbon dioxide gets transported is that it is dissolved in plasma, but that takes up only about 7 to 10 percent. Another way is it is chemically bound to hemoglobin, and it is carried in the red blood cells as carbaminohemoglobin, but that, all, that takes about just above 20 percent. And the last way is it is transported as bicarbonate ions in plasma. And that takes up about 70%. So let's look at the first way of transport, which is dissolving in plasma. Think about it as um, making iced tea. So the container will be the blood vessel. The iced tea mix will be the carbon dioxide. And the water will be the plasma. So the water, the plasma, is already inside the blood vessel. And next, we add our iced tea, or carbon dioxide. And we can see that the carbon dioxide is diffusing and dissolving into the plasma. Now let's talk about when carbon dioxide is chemically bound to hemoglobin. And it is carried in the red blood cells as carb carbaminohemoglobin. Think about the old shoot my friend with the water bottle trick that we all used to love in high school. <laughs> so the cap will represent carbon dioxide in this metaphor and the water bottle will represent hemoglobin. And just like a cap and a water bottle, carbon dioxide wants to attach to the hemoglobin. And now it is called carbamine and hemoglobin. <laughs> Incidental, I think not. So. This carbamine and hemoglobin is traveling in the blood until it gets to the alveoli. When the alveoli is present, carbon dioxide realizes that it has a lower partial pressure in the alveoli than it does in the um, hemoglobin. And it's actually, it's going to want to go to the alveoli because of the concentration gradient. So, as I, Sam Pecoraro, was saying before, uh, there is one final way in which carbon dioxide is transported to the lungs, and that is as a bicarbonate ion in plasma. The carbon dioxide enters the red blood cell and combines with water. Uh, an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase speeds up the process and forms carbonic acid. However, this soon dissociates into a hydrogen ion and a bicarbonate ion. So. The hydrogen ion uh, is in the plasma now, and it, that's what makes the blood slightly more acidic. It goes from about a 7.4 to a 7.34 on the pH scale. Uh, the bicarbonate ion is an anion, a negative charge, so uh, the blood doesn't like this too much, and it decides to counterbalance this via the chloride shift. A chloride ion uh, leaves the plasma and enters the red blood cell. So, for the carbon dioxide molecule to be released from the blood, um, bicarbonate ion within the plasma has to switch places with the chloride ion within the red blood cell. When this happens, that bicarbonate ion binds with the hydrogen ion that's left over within the red blood cell. After this, carbonic anhydrase then splits that carbonic acid into carbon dioxide and water. This carbon dioxide, along with that release from hemoglobin and solution in the plasma, diffuses along its partial pressure gradient from the blood into the alveoli. But I just don't get it! Do you have one of those crazy metaphors again? As a matter of fact, I do. Come on, guys! Garrett, throw me that popcorn.
Try to think about it in terms of making popcorn for your favorite Netflix movie, where the microwave will be the red blood cell, and the popcorn will be the carbon dioxide. When making popcorn, water will react with the kernel, and then you get the finished product of popcorn. Just like carbon dioxide combines with water to make carbonic acid, the microwave will use heat to make popcorn faster. And the heat will represent the carbonic anhydrase as the catalyst. So let's make some popcorn. So now that our reaction is finished, we have hydrogen ions we have to dissociate from the carbonic acid. And you could see that through the steam that is released. Whoa, look at well, let's just say that there was steam being released. <laughs> and now our bicarbonate ions are ready to be eaten. So I'm ready to watch my favorite movie on Netflix, when all of a sudden I realize my favorite movie isn't on Netflix. Well, that's a shame, because I've already made the popcorn, or the bicarbonate ions. But, <clears throat> I would rather eat it when I'm watching my favorite movie. So let's go reverse the action so that I have the popcorn later, when my favorite movie is back on Netflix. So just like every microwave has a popcorn button, every microwave also has an unpopcorn button. And right now, the bicarbonate ion is combining with the H ions to make carbonic acid, and then the heat or the carbon, carbonic anhydrase will then separate those two into carbon dioxide and water. Come on, come on, come on, it's almost done. So now that our reversed reaction has completed, let's see if we have the proper components that are ready to go into the alveoli. Oh, here's our water and our carbon dioxide. You see? You see? It's really not that difficult to understand. Yeah, it seems like you put a lot of effort into that. Thank you. Think I'm ready. Yep. yep.